Hi everyone, welcome to today's uh, webinar on eco-credentials and sustainability. It's the second of APAL's webinar series. Um, as we face an increasingly erratic climate and consumers are becoming more aware of how their food is produced, we hope that you find today's webinar interesting and useful. Today you will hear from Brent Clothier, Principal Scientist at, with Plant and Food Research in New Zealand, and also Dr. Anthony Kachenko, the General Manager, Data and Extension with Hort Innovation who will share their insights on how to best optimise ecosystem services and sustainability in horticulture and potential, potentially increase profitability. So before I introduce to you our first speaker, Brent, I just want to go through how we can all get the most out of this webinar. You'll see um, that we can't see you. You can see us and you can hear us. We can't see you and we can't hear you, but you can interact with us through the Q&A function. So at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a small Q&A tab that you can use to ask questions. So if you click on that tab, you can type in any questions that you have for our speakers. The, the function also enables you to um, vote for, for questions or um, reinforce questions that you can see that someone else has asked so that it pushes them to the top of the list. If um, you see a question and you want to ask a follow-up question, you can just click on that question and uh, type in a comment or um, your follow-up question in there. We'll discuss any questions at the end of both presentations. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker to kick off this session, Dr. Brent Clothier, who will speak on natural capital footprints and eco-credentials. Brent is a principal scientist with plant and food research in Palmerston North, New Zealand. He researches water, carbon and chemicals in primary production systems, sustainable practices and climate change adaptation. He also works on life cycle assessments, environmental policy and valuation of ecosystem services. Brent, it's my pleasure to hand over to you now. Kia ora tato. greetings from New Zealand. It's a pleasure here to be with you today and talking about natural capital footprints and eco-credentials. I'd like to start off by thinking about natural capital. What is it? By analogy to our financial capital, our natural capital are our stocks of natural materials and energy, our soils, our waters, our climate, and our biodiversity. It's like the principal sum, the, the financial capital. And as we have in financial capital, we get flows of interest and rents from financial capital. In natural capital, we get ecosystem services, the beneficial flows that help us uh, from the flows between the natural capital stocks themselves, such as nitrogen mineralized into the soil and taken up by the plant. That is an ecosystem services performed by the soil. Or there can be a transfer of ecosystem services between the stocks and us, humankind, because we eat the plants and we get uh, value from that. The farmer gets uh, economic value and we get nutritional value. So back in the early 2000s, there were concerns about the degradation of our environment. The United Nations, through the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, set up a large international program uh, on the ecosystem assessment. And they classified ecosystem services into four types. Supporting services, like I just mentioned in terms of nutrient cycling. Soil formation is another one. And then that's the underpinning service. Then there are provisioning services. We understand these well. This is like uh, the economic response. We get value from food, fresh water, wood, fiber, and fuel. Another one that is, is well understood, but is not valued in terms of, in a monetary sense, of the regulating services, climate regulation, how our atmosphere and our oceans regulate climate, how our soils um, provide some form of flood regulation. There is, of course, disease regulation and water purification. Many of these services are hugely valuable, yet we don't pay for them. And then, of course, there are cultural services, the aesthetics we see in nature, for me as a soil scientist, I find the picture there of soils are aesthetically beautiful. Of course, in terms of spiritual and heritage value, um, we ashes to ashes, dust to dust, we return to the soil, educational value and recreational value. 
So from those ecosystem services, the United Nations said, these underpin the constituents of our well-being, our security, our basic materials, our health, and through the cultural services, good social relations, and the freedom of choice and action. I put this up advisedly because it came out of The Economist magazine back in 2008, right at the heart of the global financial crisis. And here's half the cartoon. People spending beyond their means, banks lending beyond their means. Has the whole world gone mad? It wasn't about the global financial crisis. It was about the human overconsumption of our natural resources. And so how do we now value our natural capital and ecosystem services? There's a marvellous book that I thoroughly recommend uh, that's now just over 20 years old called Natural Capitalism. And they note in there that we can temporarily exceed the carrying capacity of our earth, but we can put our natural capital into decline. This is a bit of a spoiler because this is one of the best quotes out of this book. This intensification, put another way, the ability to accelerate a car that is low on gasoline does not prove the tank is full. And I think that's the concern that we need to be to, to address, to make sure that our tank is full and we reduce our footprint and we maintain our natural capital stocks. And so there's a groundswell of movement towards this. And supermarkets, interestingly enough, are the new regulators and they're the choice editors on our behalf. Back in 2007, the then CEO of Tesco's, a large supermarket, multinational supermarket chain, said, we will begin the search for a universally accepted and commonly understood measure of the carbon footprint of every product we sell. Why do they want to do that? Because they poll their customers and the top concern for their customers was about the environment. And so they decided that they will have product, labels on products to show how green the items are. And this is very interesting because it's the supermarkets who are the choice editors, but there's a strong role played by non-governmental organizations, NGOs like the Carbon Trust, the Worldwide Fund for Nature, Greenpeace and the Food Ethics Council. So it's a virtuous circle, the NGOs pressuring the supermarkets, the supermarkets trying to outcompete each other in their greenness. And so it's not about market access for our pr products. It's about shelf access, getting our products onto the top shelves of the premium supermarkets to get eco premium prices. Coming through to today, you look at Waitrose, another multinational British um, supermarket chain. They put out documents like this, how they are going to be involved in halting climate change, how they're going to tackle the global waste problem, and also the, the, the cultural uh, perspective around putting an end to modern slavery. Back in 2009, Walmart, the world's largest company, said it will ask its 100,000 global suppliers 15 questions before they will accept their products. You can see the range of questions they'll ask. The first four of the 15 are, have you measured your greenhouse gas emissions? Have you reported your greenhouse gas emissions to the Carbon Disclosure Project? What is your total greenhouse gas emissions in the most recent year? Have you set publicly available reduction targets? So now you can see the strong role that the supermarkets are playing in, in terms of how the products are being sold and the prices received. So back then we did a study because there was a, a lot of a challenge around apples in terms of uh, New Zealand the export of apples because of the food miles arguments. And we, in conjunction with other organizations, carried out life cycle assessment from the beginning on the farm right through to household consumption in Europe of the greenhouse gas emissions for apples. This was to debunk the idea that the emissions were related to distance from market. In certain part they are, but our, found, our findings showed that the orchard operation was about 20%, shipping is a big, big one, and there is a, a move underway now with the International Maritime Organization to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of shipping through elimination of using bunker fuel, a dirty uh, greenhouse gas emitter. 
But the other thing that we did, which was outside the publicly available specification for footprints, the past 2050, which ended at the retailer, was we thought it was interesting to go one step further and highlight the role that the consumer, us, is being part of the problem. So there are multiple carbon challenges to address right across the supply chain. The next one is water. And the Carbon Disclosure Project, who also have a water disclosure project, made a very interesting quote. If climate change were a shark, then water would be the teeth. We know what's going to bite first. And the United Nations, through the Food Organization, uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, put out a table like this to say how much water is needed to produce a glass of beer, a glass of wine, um, a hamburger, which is not a good look. And so there are many NGOs pushing for water su sustainability targets. Should there be water labels on food, the um, Food Ethics Council noted. They argued that detailed labels could be confusing and have risk of unintended consequences. So they suggested another form about some recognition of good stewardship. And I'll come, I'll come to this right at the end about how you can go from a full life cycle assessment through to some labelling in relation to stewardship. Walmart, of course, we, I mentioned about these 15 questions. Two of the 15 questions were, if measured, please report total water use to produce your products. Have you set water reduction targets? If so, what are they? Unilever, a huge organisation themselves who produce a range of products like this, also have put out public documents saying our impacts occur mainly in the growing of raw materials and in the consumer use of our products. And they have set targets to reduce the water footprint of the raw materials and also identify where raw materials come from parts of the world that are already water stressed. And so the supermarkets play an interesting role and there's some fascinating articles around about sustainable supply chains. And I like this, can retailers be the rising tide that lifts all boats towards sustainability? If we choose to get our products on the top shelves of the premium supermarkets, then that is a good signal that we can use and that can lift the boats through to the consumer as well. Coming back to the, to the stewardship, there's a lot of eco-credentialing schemes around. And the good thing about these are there is no greenwashing. There's no unrealistic um, predictions about how green products are. These are recognized, they're understood, they're audited, and they're believable. So you can see there's a wide range of labels that can be used for stewardship to provide the consumer with a confidence that the product has been grown sustainably. Here in New Zealand, there's a, an exemplar of eco-credentialing and it's about sustainable wine growing New Zealand, SWINS. It's part of New Zealand, uh, New Zealand wine growers and it is an industry-wide metric eco-credential for the sustainable growing of wines. The really interesting about this thing about this is, New Zealand wine is seen as a premium product. The strap line of Wine Growers New Zealand is pure discovery. And so it fits in very, very closely with this idea of sustainability. The amazing thing is that 98% of New Zealand's vineyard producing area is certified with SWINS, Sustainable Wine Growing New Zealand. So this is a, a huge example of how an eco-credentialing scheme can be used industry-wide to bring eco-premium prices. I'll just conclude with a sort of an academic um, paper that came out in the Harvard Business Review, Competitive Advantage on a Warming Planet by Lash and Wellington. The summary of the article goes like this. First thing, quantify your footprint. The second thing is assess the risks and opportunities of not quantifying your footprint or quantifying your footprint. The risks could be regulatory. You could fall outside the law. You could be, in that regard, 
um, in, in, in fear of litigation, and also you could lose your reputation. So the Sustainable Wine Growing New Zealand protects the reputation of pure discovery that New Zealand wine growers have. But on the other side, there's many, many opportunities, cost savings, price premiums, efficiencies, and new technologies for a future world. Adapt your business to those, and of course, do it better than your rivals, because you want to get on the shelf of the world's premium supermarkets. So thank you very much, because sustainability is surely our resilient future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brent. Um, we'll save any questions um, for the end, but don't forget to add your questions to the Q&A feature at the bottom. We've got a few questions coming in already, so that's great to see. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Anthony Kachenko, who will speak about the Australian horticulture sustainability story. Anthony is the general manager for data and extension with Hort Innovation. He joined Hort Innovation in 2014 as the head of research and development Prior to this appointment, he spent seven years at Green Life Industry Australia in a variety of policy and management roles. At Hort Innovation, Anthony's team is responsible for amplifying the outcomes of levy investments and providing data, knowledge and insights to underpin all business activities. He's also leading the development of the sustainability framework for Australian horticulture, which is, which is what he will talk to you about today. So Anthony, I will now hand over to you. Great, thanks very much, Rose, for that introduction. And it's great to be here this afternoon, uh, walking through this initiative, uh, which was a key initiative in Hort Innovations company strategy. Um, and I've got five minutes to give you a whistle stop tour in terms of the activity today, um, and give you some insights into where it's headed. To start with, um, there's a huge opportunity for horticulture uh, to tell our story, and we have a great story to tell before somebody else tells it for us. And that was feedback we heard loud and clear when we were undertaking consultation in the development of the company strategy. And that's why uh, we made a commitment to include the sustainability framework um, in a, a, as part of um, our company's um, uh, remit going forward. Um, there's a couple of uh, major reasons that um, made us make that decision, and that's around the social license conversation that we're hearing uh, in order to ensure that industries can um, gain and maintain community trust in terms of their operating environment. We also saw it as an opportunity to uh, provide a holistic approach uh, around the triple bottom line, social, environmental, and um, economic uh, opportunities for horticulture and drive it for the sector rather than having um, several sustainability frameworks and a um, uncoordinated approach for horticulture. Um, it's important as well that um, in doing so, we can build trust um, with, with consumers um, and also identify areas for horticulture to prioritize, well, where can we, we uh, lean in or um, focus our efforts going forward, particularly from a research perspective. Um, and finally, um, there's a little bit of conversation around um, how we leverage the image, both domestically and from an international perspective around trade and trade development. We often use the clean and green imagery, and it's important that we can uh, verify that and have some veracity behind that by uh, having data and having a framework for horticulture uh, to ensure that when we make those claims, where um, we, we can back them up. Um, internationally, uh, the United Nations have set some sustainable development goals. Um, I've provided them in the, the slide here. We, we are intending to align the framework to those goals. A number of um, listed companies here in Australia are already doing that. Um, at an industry level, um, there are um, entities that um, have taken sustainability as a core part of their business. 
Um, we see this framework as complementing what's already being done. Um, by no means is it a compliance tool. It's a tool that we want to use to demonstrate uh, to the audience and the, the broader industry, both here domestically and globally, uh, that horticulture is in a, a great place and leading the charge and taking ownership for sustainability going forward. So just to, to flag a couple of the key initiatives that have been um, sitting behind the framework today, uh, the project kicked off about eight months ago uh, with a delivery partner, Roth Rural, driving the charge. Um, the first activity that was undertaken was a materiality assessment, looking at, I guess, the issues both here locally and, and internationally that matter most um, to, to industry and are the ones that should be um, uh, framed or included in the framework going forward. Um, we also undertook a survey with stakeholders to look at what matters most. Um, some 400 responses were received and that allowed us to undertake some prioritization around the key issues. By no means are we done, there's a lot more consultation to occur. Um, and I'll touch on that briefly in a moment. Um, also, if you recall, I mentioned about getting some quantifiable data to sit behind this. Again, the project team has been trolling through the documentation to ensure that um, we can, um, we can provide a degree of veracity behind some of the claims going, going forward. A, a quick snapshot in terms of the feedback from the survey and some of the issues that were flagged. I guess the key takeaway here is that those matters, those issues that mattered most to the hort sector um, were also, um, you know, they mattered equally um, and, and rated equally so with our external stakeholders. And there was a, a almost perfect linear alignment there in terms of, in terms of that, that relationship. Um, when, when we try and cluster um, the initiatives together. At this stage, we've landed on six broad themes that I've illustrated on the, the slide here and 21 uh, groupings um, under those, those broad themes, uh, covering everything from you know, the vibrant, ethical, resilient production sector um, through to climate and energy. Um, and as you can see in, in how these have been grouped, um, we've tried to align uh, like with like um, and they picked they pick up on, um, as I said earlier, in, in environmental, economic and social um, elements. Uh, finally, in terms of how this could look going forward, um, I've got an example here from the dairy industry, um, which, tries, which has a framework and they've grouped um, their issues under key themes. Um, they've provided some baseline metrics and they've also tracked the status towards how they're how they're achieving those metrics. We envisage something that will look like this, and this is very much part of the, the next steps of consultation. So that leads me into where we're going with this. A document was released um, only a week ago, which provides a little bit more context to what I've outlined today. It includes um, the imagery that I've presented and also fleshes out a little bit more the conversation that we've captured. At the moment, uh, uh, the Roth Rural team are consulting with peak industry bodies to look at alignment and where it sits. And going forward, uh, we will be releasing a discussion paper that will allow stakeholders to provide commentary in terms of you know, what the document is, those key issues and how it's shaping up. All information um, around today's presentation and these documents are on our website. I've provided the link here um, and I've also provided my contact details here uh, should you wish to reach out to me and um, discuss this initiative further. So thanks very much for your time. Thanks very much, Anthony. Um, okay, I, we've got a few questions coming in, quite a few questions coming in on our Q&A um, panel. Brent, just to start off with, obviously this kind of work has been going on in New Zealand for a little while now. Um, what, what do you, has there been a lot of uptake with 
the wider industry aside from the the viticulture industry and and what are the main drivers for industries taking this up is it does it open access um to to export markets or um how is how do you see that um growers become motivated enough to to take up some of these initiatives Yes, it goes back to the the food miles argument back in the 2007-2008. So our Ministry of Primary Industries embarked on a program to co-invest with the industries. So the industries and the work that um, I was involved with, with colleagues in land care research, were kiwi fruit, apples, wine industry, and berry fruit. Meanwhile, there was also the red meat industry, the fishing industry, and sheep and beef um, as well. Um, and, and also, I should add, dairy. So there was a, a, across the whole of agriculture, an, a, a, a ministry-led effort to debunk the food miles argument. And that was, that was done, and there was quite a good engagement with the industries. And then things sort of went a bit quiet, but it's very interesting that in the last two years, um, there has been a resurgence of interest by our industries around um, minimising the footprint, eco-credentialing. So we are seeing uh, over the last two years, more interest in, in having a look again at LCA, because we worked out what the reduction options uh, could be. And so there's an interest now to say, has there been continuous improvement over the last 12 years or so? So, yes. Yeah, okay. And so one of the questions is regarding the um, SWNZ um, that you mentioned. Oh, where did that go? Um, do they, uh, does, does that carry weight when the wineries that, oh, I'm not really sure I understand that question actually. Regarding SWNZ, how do these claims carry weight when the wineries much, are much greater greenhouse gas emitters and not certified? So I think they, they're saying the wine is, yeah. the, yeah. is the certification mechanism, but the wineries themselves are not um, certified. Yeah, look, when we, when we did, when we did the, the um, uh, it's what's called in life cycle assessment, a functional unit, um, we, we looked that the functional unit, we considered a bottle of wine landed in a foreign market. So that included all the emissions from the winery and the transport and the shipping and the bottle. Um, so it did include that. Um, the winery emissions are not that great in New Zealand for the simple reason that um, we and in our electricity, we have 65% of our energy comes from hydro and coming from other renewable sources. So the winery is not such a big emitter. Okay. So is there any evidence that the Swins has actually attracted a premium price? Yes. Yeah. And so the, the both uh, um, apple, apples, and, um, apples and pears New Zealand and Zespri for the kiwi fruit and New Zealand wine there, it's documented evidence that the eco premium prices for those products. We don't sell, we don't sell wine at the lowest possible price. It's very much aimed at a at a, a premium price with that labelling around pure discovery. Drink this wine; it's good for you in moderation. It's good for you, and it's good for the environment in which it was grown. And it has the lower carbon footprint. What I noticed than milk, which is um, yes, yes, nice. yes. <laughs> um, it does. Has the apple industry moved towards a labelling sort of system similar to the wine industry in New Zealand? Or this is one of the one of the initiatives that's happening right at this time being now. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I should I should also say that in terms of eco credentialing, our apple industry, like the Australian apple industry, has a very strong. Um, history and record of spray diaries for export. So, and, and these spray diaries have to be conditioned for which export market's going to because of different regulatory um, concerns in foreign markets. So there has been a long, long history in the apple industry of recording spray diaries for export purposes. 
Yeah, okay. So Anthony, do you see um, any sustainability programs such as this happening in Australia? Yeah, um, I think um, a couple of um, couple of comments. Um, you know, in developing the framework, we're looking across all of the agri sector, and um, we're um, we're mindful of alignment where we can um, with, say, the beef industry, cotton industry, dairy industry, and so on. The project team working on this um, has direct experience in developing those frameworks. So I guess what we're trying to do is not reinvent the wheel, but ensure that there is alignment um, in terms of meeting different stakeholder needs. And um, there's a question here, Anthony, about whether the Hort Innovation Sustainability Framework will align with the FAO sustainability goals and how you plan to measure success against those goals. Um, are you able to respond to that? Yes, um, we are mapping the, um, the uh, issues that are coming through against the FAO's, FAO, uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, the key challenge for us going forward will be measurement and looking at ways that industry um, will prioritise that um, through either new investments um, or existing data sets and helping prioritise um, the pipeline of, of, um, of activity going forward. I made mention that this will trigger uh, industries to think differently about some of the, the investments and also ways of using this framework to establish the context of how the industry is, is future focused. And I think it will, will spark a healthy debate um, to address some of those gaps going forward. Yeah, okay. Um, so one of the participants says that one of the common market claims is that Australian supermarkets aren't really focused on promoting low impact products. They're more focused on packaging. Um, so different types of packaging um, and environmentally more favourable packaging, I guess. So uh, I guess this is a question for, for both of you, because obviously I imagine similar things happen in New Zealand as well. What do you think needs to change to make grocers and maybe Australian grocers uh, more uh, promote um, the low carbon and water safe or more, um, I guess, products with a lower carbon and water footprint? So how, how would Australian supermarkets go about promoting that? I guess the, the one comment I'll make is um, in developing the framework and what underpins it, we've got to have very open conversations with the retailers um, in terms of what matters most to them um, and think about, you know, how, um, you know, how there is alignment between what's happening um, in, in, in our regional communities and the expectations of retailers and consumers going forward. So they're very much part of the conversation from our perspective in terms of establishing what matters most to them. I suppose there's a slightly different perspective here in New Zealand because 65% of our export revenues come from agriculture. So we're very focused on meeting the eco credentialing requirements of uh, our foreign markets. It, it's interesting you mentioned that, Rose. Of course, there's been a huge um, push to eliminate plastic, uh, plastic bags, single use plastic bags here, and that's been highly successful. And I think, uh, you know, th this is the sort of the, the beginning, uh, this is the rising tide uh, uh, lifting all boats that I sort of mentioned, you know, we eliminate single use plastic, then what's the next question we do ask? And, uh, and so that could well happen here, now that we've got rid of single use plastic bags. Yeah, and I guess on the other side of that is at the other end of the spectrum, you know, where the fruit comes from or the, the produce comes from is how, how do growers or, or industries measure ecosystem services. Um, you know, what, aside from obviously, if they're able to implement, um, you know, more efficient practices and get a premium for a product that is um, eco-certified, um, what, what other benefits are they getting from that? And how do they, how do they um, measure that to, to prove that they're doing the right thing? I might have a go there on, uh, from, from this side here. Um, there, there's a, uh, New Zealand's just passed a zero carbon bill, so they want a, um, a realistic price for carbon. And so that is something that will move, move in terms of, you know, this is this thing I said about um, opportunities and risks um, there. 
And the other thing is we have a national policy statement on freshwater management that is going to have some, some requirements around um, the water regulating, so water quantity and water quality. So those regulatory issues are starting to rear their heads here. And I know they are in Australia too. Yeah, very much so, Brett. I think there, there's certainly a lot of conversation um, here in Australia in terms of um, being able to quantify um, the benefits. And I think, again, it's going to be captured in the conversation going ahead, you know, in terms of, you know, how can we do that? And, you know, is there a credit system? Is there an approach to, um, to feed back to, to, to growers um, in terms of, you know, the way that they manage um, their ecosystem services into the future? Okay, I think we might, um, we'll just take one more question. And so um, do you think, Anthony, this one's probably more aimed at you, but do you think Australian consumers are as tuned into sustainability as international customers? I know Brent mentioned that, you know, New Zealand obviously exports a lot more um, apples to than, than Australia does. So, you know, they need to meet international demands, but Australia doesn't export as many apples. Do you think Australian um, consumers are going to be willing to pay more for um, certified apples or apples that are produced more sustainably? I think we're, we're certainly seeing that the data that we're seeing suggests that there is a, a, a generational change there in terms of um, what, what matters most to the individuals and consumers. Um, we're also seeing that at, at this stage, you know, horticulture, more broadly speaking, um, is seen favourably in the eyes of the community. Um, and so we've got to look at ways to, um, to leverage both the, um, the trends that we're observing and then also the community sentiment around horticulture going forward. Um, and very much so, one, you know, the, the opportunity to, to you know, drive a premium uh, price over a product that has sustainable credentials or is grown sustainably or the organisation um, follows a sustainable um, framework or strategy could very much so be the case in the next, uh, across the next decade. Um, Brent, could, could I add something? Could, yeah, could I add just a little bit there that, you know, um, it, it seems likely in a post-COVID world that there could be uh, an Oceania, um, East Asia bubble. And we need to uh, be very cognizant of the environmental concerns of consumers in, in, in East Asia, and especially amongst the growing middle class who will be buying our um, agricultural products in East Asia. That's probably very true, I'd say. Hmm. Okay. Um, uh, what is, just this one last question. So what's your take on the current demand from Tesco and others, other big supermarket chains that now now that carbon miles has been replaced with sustainability. So I guess the new terminology is sustainability rather than carbon miles. Yes, that's that's why I sort of, uh, I presume that was for me. Um, I, I presume that's why I said you can do the full life cycle assessment, but that's too hard for a consumer to get their head around. Um, it's a very detailed um, consideration. But, and that's where this rise of these eco credentialing schemes, such as Sustainable One Growing New Zealand or Global Gap, or some of those other, LEAF is another one in Europe. So, some of those recognized, audited, and transparent schemes that are devoid of greenwash, uh, I think, are important. And that makes the customer feel happy without having this massive sort of academic tome on the life cycle assessment. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, and I guess this is a question for both of you. How do you, Anthony, I guess, you know, as you're still in the developmental phase of this strategy for us, the Australian um, horticultural industry, how do you expect monitoring and evaluation of sustainability indicators to be established and, and would they be regulated and if so, how? And I guess, the same question to you, Brent, once uh, when Anthony sort of finished is how, how has that worked in New Zealand, in the New Zealand situation? Because obviously you guys are a little uh, more ahead of where we're at at the moment. Um, so maybe there are some learnings for, for the Australian industry from what New Zealand has been through. Sure. Um, so the, the key thing I, I wish to flag is that this framework isn't a one-off. It's something that will be established and then it will require commitment 
not only from us, but from the broader Hort Industries to, um, to invest in it going forward uh, and to make sure that you know, it retains currency in, in, in a number of fronts, including the way we invest on behalf of levy payers um, and uh, engagement with key stakeholders going forward. I don't see it as a, as a it's not a regulatory piece. It's, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's an initiative that industry will own and industry um, will you know, shepherd going forward. Um, so hopefully that, that provides some context in terms of the commitment going forward from our end. Yeah, and I think if we go back to 2008, 2009, when MPI, our Ministry of Primary Industries, embarked on this, there was a lot of, as Anthony sort of mentioned, was, oh, not another regulation, not another series of things we have to collect. And then it's gone from that to recognising that the, on the opportunity side, the, the, a reduction in carbon emissions, a reduction in water use that doesn't compromise quality is a saving in cost and it provides those opportunities in the marketplace. And so I, I, I sense now that it's sort of a badge of honour in, in a certain sense that these people have, have got some demonstrable metric of the sustainability. I think, I think they're pretty proud of it actually. Yeah. Yep. So there's, there's almost a sense of ownership and responsibility. Yes, um, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I guess that's a key to adoption in a lot of cases, isn't it? Yeah. The, the stages of adoption from <laughs> anger through to acceptance. Um, all right, we're going to wrap up today because that's all we've got time for. It's been a really interesting discussion and thank you so much for everybody that has contributed uh, questions. And if you, if there are any questions we haven't got to today, please contact Anthony or Brent directly. Um, and I'm sure they'd be more than happy to continue the conversation with you. Now, thank you, Anthony and Brett, Brent, for sharing your experiences and your time with us today. For those of you who have been um, watching and participating, you can find today's presentations in the Future Orchards Library on the APAL website under the event, uh, in, sorry, not under the events tab. A recording of the webinar will be available in a few days. Now, we'll be conducting a short evaluation at the end of this webinar. So when you're leaving the webinar, you'll see a short, a little pop-up box directing you to an online survey. We'd really appreciate if you could take a couple of minutes to complete this because we really value your feedback so that we can tailor any future webinars to, to what our industry um, wants to hear about. Speaking of webinars, you will see that we've got some more webinars coming up um, in the next, over the next few months as we're all um, under COVID lockdown still. You can also see more details of these webinars on the APAL website. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Hort Innovation because this webinar was funded by Hort Innovation using the apple and pear industry R&D levy contributions from the Australian government. Yeah. Okay, and before you go off to complete the survey, I just wanted to give you a quick update on one of APAL's other programs, which is the Future Business Program. The Future Business team are continuing to collect insurance related data to understand how much businesses are paying for insurance and what type of coverage different people in different orchards have. We're encouraging small, medium sized businesses to participate in the data collection process to help understand and, and help us advocate on the industry's behalf as it may mean a better premium through utilizing a group buying deal. If you'd like more information on this, please reach out to Rochelle Zealy. You can see her contact details at the bottom of the slide there. Um, she's the future business manager. Participation in any data collection um, through this process doesn't mean that you're bound to the outcome. It's just to help us understand whether we have a higher or low incidence of claims and how much businesses are paying for insurance. In the meantime, stay healthy and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thanks very much for participating.